Hello, everybody. This is Ken Brady, Director of Sunday School for Lifeway Christian Resources, and this is the Bible Studies for Life session number five in our Holy Vocabulary series. This would have taken place in our churches on Sunday, March the 29th, 2020, but many of us are sheltering in place or we're obeying social distancing requests from our state and national leaders, and we're not venturing out for church. And if your group has not yet figured out how to use other technologies like Zoom or Facebook Live, then this uh, videotaping hopefully will be a way for you to experience Bible study in this Bible Studies for Life series. We are in a series, as I mentioned, called Holy Vocabulary, where we are unpacking a number of words, six different words that are understood inside the church, but may not be understood by people outside the church who are not yet connected to God or to our church families. And this particular Sunday's lesson is session five in a series of six, and this one is called Sanctified. So we'll be taking a look at what the word sanctified really means. In our study guide, which is really the heart of our Bible Studies for Life series, uh, each participant in the group would have a copy of the study guide. Now I've been able to take the study guide and put it on the screen for you. And so uh, as we would be in a group, uh, we would open our study guide and have this page looking at us right here, this young lady looking at a book. And the question that always uh, begins our sessions here in Bible Studies for Life is open-ended and it just is designed to get our groups talking. And if we were together, here's the question that we would answer together. And that is this, growing up, what children's book was your favorite? I want you to think about that for just a moment. What was your favorite book? What was the go-to book that uh, at bedtime you would ask your mom or dad to read to you? And it was one maybe that you have grown up and as you've had your own children, maybe you've read that book to them because you loved it so much as a child. Well, I got to thinking about this and quite honestly, all of my favorite books came from one author and that is Dr. Seuss. I absolutely love and can still remember my mother reading these books to me. Uh, the Cat in the Hat was probably my favorite. Of course, there was Green Eggs and Ham, love that one, and then How the Grinch Stole Christmas, and then the One Fish, Two Fish, Red Fish, Blue Fish. Maybe one of those four were one of your favorites. Maybe you have another one that was really the one that you uh, loved for your parents to read to you. Now, this is my grandson, Logan. He is about two and a half years old, and he is full of personality, a lot of life in this kid. And every night, my son and my daughter-in-law tell me he has a particular book that he wants them to read to him, and it is this one right here, Dragons Love Tacos. Now, I have to admit, I've never read Dragons Love Tacos, but I can guess from the picture on the book that it is a story about a dragon who, well, yes, he loves tacos. He's laying here on the front of the book. He's got tacos in his mouth, tacos laying by him on the ground, and tacos uh, piled up there on his, on his big belly. Well, for whatever reason, my grandson Logan loves this book. Now, why are we talking about children's books uh, here in an adult Bible study. Well, I'll tell you why here in just a moment. Every time we get together for Bible Studies for Life sessions, every Bible study has just one main point. And it's one thing that I have to remember coming out of the Bible study. It makes it very simple for me and for my group members. And so the point in this Bible study is that you and I as believers, we are set apart in Christ to live holy lives. That's what we're uh, assigned to do. That's what the word sanctified means. It means to set apart for a special purpose. Uh, in the scriptures, people were sometimes sanctified and they were set apart for certain tasks and, and things. And then objects could be set apart for use by God. And so uh, in the tabernacle and uh, in the temple, uh, those instruments for worship were often sanctified and they were set apart for that very holy purpose. Well, today, you and I as believers, we are set apart in Christ, and we are set apart to, to live very differently from the world, and we're set apart to live holy lives that will hopefully point people to Christ. Now, in every Bible Studies for Life session, we uh, begin very early in the session with the Bible meets life. Think of this as an intersection 
of life and the Bible. Why and how does the Bible speak to life today? It was, you know, it was written several thousand years ago, and so we believe the Bible speaks today and it meets our life's needs today. Well, here in the opening section called Bible Meets Life, the author of this session uh, gets to this uh, idea of, uh, uh, of telling his kids a story uh, from a book called The Very Hungry Caterpillar, and he mentions it just right off the bat, and there's a picture of the book, and he goes on to say that uh, in this story, uh, this caterpillar in the book had a, a, an insatiable appetite. It just loved to eat all the time, and it was never satisfied, but one day it did wake up, and all of a sudden, the, the insatiable uh, hunger that it had had, it was gone. It, it no longer uh, crawled around looking for food, in fact, it realized that it had sprouted wings from which it could, it could use to fly. And so the author uh, revealed here in the book, uh, this very hungry caterpillar, that the, the caterpillar was designed to become a beautiful butterfly. And the author of our Bible study today reminded us that this is similar to what we experience as believers. Uh, God has set us apart. We are destined. We are sanctified and we are set aside to have a different kind of life. We're, we're not to be what we once were before we came to Christ, but in Christ we become new and we live differently than the way we used to live. And that's really the theme of our Bible study and how the Bible intersects life. Well, if you're not familiar with Bible Studies for Life, it's broken down into three different sections of Scripture. And in this first one, verses uh, 9 through 11 of chapter 6, uh, we're going to listen in to Paul's conversation with a very real church that existed in the first century. And I have blown out the text so that you can see it, but I've got an arrow pointing it to it to it in the uh, personal study guide, just in case some of you out there happen to have your adult personal study guide and you want to follow along in that. Well, here's what Paul wrote to the church in Corinth. He said in verse 9 of chapter 6, don't you know that the unrighteous will not inherit God's kingdom? He says, do not be deceived. No sexually immoral people, idolaters, adulterers, or males who have sex with males, no thieves, no greedy people, no drunkards, no verbally abusive people or swindlers will inherit God's kingdom. Verse 11, he says, and some of you used to be like this, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. Now, that's a lot to unpack. I, I'm telling you, we could literally spend our entire Bible study this morning on these three verses, 9, 10, and 11. Paul asked the question at the very beginning here, don't you know? And he is going to use that same question 10 times during his conversation here uh, with the Corinthian church. Paul is urging the Corinthians to stop indulging themselves in the same kinds of evil sinful behaviors uh, of those kinds of people that are already destined for judgment. And Paul addresses uh, them and, and uses this term. He says, no sexually immoral people. Well, that would have included, that phrase would have included all kinds of sexual and immoral acts, everything from uh, premarital sex to adultery and all other kinds of sexual vices. And Paul gave particular attention to the sin of homosexuality. And he used two words that are translated, males who have sex with males. And both of these words refer to those who corrupted normal male and female sexual roles and relations with same-sex roles. So Paul is letting them know that if they are walking in this way, they are in danger of not inheriting God's kingdom. Now, there are some of us that are listening to this, uh, this particular Bible study, and you might be saying to yourself, no, wait a minute, nobody may know this, but a long time ago, uh, I committed adultery, or I, I did something, I stole something, I'm a thief, that verse 10 describes, or I've been drunk, uh, that verse 10 also describes. Does this mean I am not able to inherit God's kingdom? And the answer is no. Thankfully, God removes our sin from us as far as the east is from the west. And the Bible tells us that he is faithful and he's just 
And if we will confess our sin, he will forgive us of our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's what the word says. Now, what Paul is describing here is a person who claims to have come to Christ, but just continues plowing straight ahead in a sinful lifestyle. They live no differently. There is no demonstration of yielding and submitting to Christ's lordship. There is no sign of the Holy Spirit's indwelling presence and power in that person's life. This is a wake-up call to people in the Corinthian church that are continuing to live in an evil way. Now, Paul uses several words that are extremely important here, and he uses three that I've highlighted here on the screen. He uses the word washed, sanctified, and the word justified. And all three of these are uh, extremely important in his argument to the Corinthians that, that they are different than what they used to be. He says, first, he says, you were washed. You're washed clean. Uh, your sins have been washed by Christ. And you see similar language in Psalm chapter 51. And then on the next page, on page 44, he goes on to talk about uh, the other two words, sanctified, being set apart and then being justified. And I've heard preachers over the years try to explain the word justified by this. They say, just think of it like this. It's just as if I'd never sinned. And so these three words describe a beautiful condition that the believer finds themselves in. They are washed. They're sanctified. They're justified. They are so different than what they used to be. And that's just a glorious picture of the new life that we have in Christ. Well, in the second section of Scripture, you can see here on the screen, uh, 1 Corinthians 6, verses 12 to 17. That is a long passage of Scripture. There's lots of words. And, uh, and so uh, I want to zoom in, and I won't explode those out on the side like I did previously, but we're just going to zoom in and take a closer look at these because it is such a long passage we're going to take a look at now. But here's 1 Corinthians 6, verses 12 through 17. Paul continues his conversation with the Corinthians, and he says in verse 12, everything is permissible for me. He is now quoting them. This is one of their maxims. And he says, but not everything is beneficial. He said, everything is permissible for me, as he quotes them again. But then he says, but I will not be mastered by anything. Verse 13, he says, food is for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will do away with both of them. However, the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. Verse 14, he says, God raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Verse 15, he says, don't you know that your bodies are a part of Christ's body? So should I take a part of Christ's body and make it a part of a prostitute? Absolutely not. Verse 16, he says, don't you know that anyone joined to a prostitute is one body with her? For the scripture says the two will become one flesh. Verse 17, he finishes this section by saying, but anyone joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Now, I got to tell you, Paul came out swinging here. Uh, he went back to some things that the Corinthians were saying. They were saying, hey, everything is permissible for me now that I'm in Jesus. My sins are forgiven. I can live any way that I want to. And, and they were trying to legitimize their lifestyle choices, their sinful choices. But Paul, after he quoted them, he countered them. And he said, yes, I hear what you're saying. Everything is permissible. But then he says, but not everything is beneficial. And he turned the Corinthians' freedom argument on its head. For the believer, the question should never come down to whether something is lawful or right, but whether it benefits. And Paul wanted the Corinthians to understand that the determining factor of true Christian conduct never rests on an individual's right to do something, but whether that conduct ultimately helps themselves or others. And Paul says, I will not be mastered by anything. That was another part of his argument and his refutation of the Corinthians' claim of uh, freedom to do anything. And Paul refused to claim his freedom to engage in anything and certainly not uh, to any sinful activity. Doing so would have had the exact opposite effect of enslaving himself to such a practice. He would never dare to uh, step into habitual sin because ultimately he would be mastered by that sin. Now in verse 13, he, he uses another phrase. He says, the food is for the stomach and the stomach 
for food. And this reflected the Corinthians expression of their rights concerning their bodies. They essentially believed that they had a biological need to eat. Well, they did. And furthermore, they believe that since God will do away with the, the body and the, uh, the processing of food, uh, things like this, he says uh, that uh, they just decided that the body didn't really matter. They could live however they wanted to physically because spiritually they knew that they were saved. They, they saw the body and spirit as, as two separate things. But, but Paul dismantled their erroneous principle that the stomach and therefore the body are irrelevant in the coming kingdom of God. In fact, he argued that they were wrong on both counts. First, God designed our bodies, the bodies of believers, for much more than biological functions and certainly not uh, for sexual uh, immorality. The human body has a much higher purpose than just sexual gratification. Second, you know, Paul had a better uh, proverb in mind. In fact, uh, he countered the Corinthian argument with his own theological construct. And he said this, the body is for the Lord and the Lord is for the body. And so the fact in here in verse 14 that God uh, will also raise believers' bodies at the resurrection, he'll raise them from the dead, just as he raised up the Lord, has enormous implications. You know, believers should not use their bodies for dishonorable purposes. Rather, they should use their bodies for God's glory. He has completely destroyed the argument that the Corinthians had here. He's such a brilliant writer, and he's writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Well, here in verse 15, Paul continued arguing uh, that the analogy between eating and having sex did not hold up. Specifically, he addressed the problem of the Corinthians going to the temple of Aphrodite to engage in sex with temple prostitutes. And again, he says, don't you know? First, you know, as, as followers of Jesus, the bodies of the Corinthians belong to the Lord. And for a believer to engage in sexual immorality, it meant that he belonged, he, he, that what belonged to Christ uh, was now being joined to a prostitute. And, and for Paul, this was a horrible thought. In fact, he said in the strongest ways, you know, may it never be so, or absolutely not, is how the CSB translates that here. Strong words from the Apostle Paul to the Corinthians, and quite honestly, strong words from the Apostle Paul to you and I. Well, here in the next section of Scripture, uh, 1 Corinthians 6, verses 18, 19, 20, this is where we'll wrap up our study. Uh, Paul is going to, uh, to give us some fantastic advice because he knows that we are going to be tempted in this lifetime. He knew that the Corinthians were in a city that was a, a very uh, sensual city. A lot of immorality taking place in the city of Corinth, uh, temples to pagan gods, and many times those, those worship rituals included uh, sex with temple prostitutes. And so to the Corinthians and then also to us, because the Lord preserved these words for us in his, in his holy Bible, uh, these words speak to us today. And here's what Paul said as we wrap up this study this morning. He said, flee sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the person who is sexually immoral sins against his own body. Verse 19 says, uh, don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought at a price, so glorify God with your body. Now, let me get slightly technical here just for a second. Here in verse 18, Paul gives a strong command, flee sexual immorality. In the original language, in the Greek language in which we translate this into English, this was written uh, with a present imperative, and it carried the sense of fleeing without delay and continuing to flee until the danger is past. Now, think about the story from Genesis chapter 39, verses 1 through 12, where Joseph is living uh, in Potiphar's house. He's a very important person in this government official's home, but Potiphar's wife decided that she wanted to go to bed and sleep with Joseph. But Joseph, when he was tempted by her, ran out of the room and he left some clothes there. She was holding on to clothes and, and he literally slipped out of his clothes, some of them, and, and ran away from the temptation that was at hand. 
This is exactly what Paul is telling you and I to do and what he was telling the Corinthians to do. Flee sexual immorality. Do it without delay. You do it until the danger is past. Paul also uh, continued to argue uh, that sexual sin is directed specifically against one's own body. Now, that, though not necessarily the worst sin, sexual sin does stand out as a unique one in character, uh, rising from within the body and the mind and bent on personal gratification. Sexual desire drives like no other impulse. Sexual sin can internally destroy a person like no other sin because of the uniqueness of sexual intimacy. Now, in verse 19 to 20, we'll wrap up our study, and, and Paul returns to the question again, don't you know? And he is doing this to make clear something that the Corinthians should have been able to figure out. When they sinned, they not only sinned against their own bodies, but they also sinned against the temple of the Holy Spirit. Their bodies properly belonged to God since they were the temple of the Holy Spirit and had been purchased through redemption. So by combining the image of the temple along with their being bought at a price, Paul emphasized that their bodies, uh, that their bodies in their present existence, they belong to God. Now, Paul could drive home this point, and he said they must glorify God with their bodies, which obviously meant no sexual immorality. Now, the argument that so many of us may hear from our contemporaries, from people at the office, or maybe we hear it from our children, or we hear it from just friends and acquaintances, you may hear somebody say this, it's my body, and I can do with it whatever I want. However, that does not make theological sense for any believer to claim, because as Christians, our bodies do not belong to us. They belong to God. He not only makes his dwelling place in the life of the believer, but he also has paid for every believer with the blood of his son, and therefore he calls all believers to practice sexual purity, not only because of the way sexual sin affects the body, but because the body it affects does not belong to the believer. I hope that that makes sense. Now, in our study guide, uh, we have an activity page uh, in every session, something that we usually do in a group setting and we interact with the study material. And this particular one uh, has got an outline, a silhouette of a person. And uh, it just says here, sketch below, uh, use that sketch below to describe how Christians can use our bodies to glorify God and one is already given as an example. So let me zoom in on that. And you can see here that uh, one of the things that was thought of was we could use our, our hands, our fingers, to hold a pen and we could write notes of encouragement to others. That would be one way that we could use our, our bodies to glorify God. But I've thought of several others. Maybe you're already thinking of some too. I can use my mind to study and to memorize scripture. Uh, that would uh, absolutely bring glory to God. I could use my hands to pick up food or groceries for a neighbor during these days of the coronavirus uh, pandemic. We may have people uh, right here next door to us uh, that are living alone and they need help, and we could be hands and feet for them and use our bodies to glorify God by serving others. I can use my knees to get on my knees and pray and, uh, and take petitions and prayer requests to the Lord on behalf of my family and others. So I can pray. I can also use my mouth to speak encouraging words and blessings on others. I can use my heart uh, to worship the Lord, uh, much like you're doing right now. What you're doing by using your mind, uh, you're worshiping the Lord through the study of his word. And then finally, I can use my feet to take, take walks. And on these walks, I can take in nature. I can worship God for creating everything that I see, the trees, the sky, the sun. Uh, everything else that I might run across on this walk. And I can, I can pray as I walk. I don't have to close my eyes, but I can talk to my Heavenly Father. These are just some ways that we can use our bodies to glorify God. Now, every Bible Studies for Life session ends with three different ideas for using what we have learned today. And so let's walk through these, and then I will see you next time. So uh, here we go. The first one, first suggestion is that we offer thanks. Uh, that we would reflect on how our lives have been changed because of Christ, and that we would thank him for setting us free 
from the former way that we used to live and the former person that we used to be. Number two, we can memorize, we can use our minds, and we might want to memorize the 1 Corinthians 6, 19 to 20 passage and to repeat it to ourselves when we need to flee from temptation. Don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? You're not your own. You were bought at a price, so glorify God with your body. Maybe some of us need to memorize that and make that part of our life going forward, that we do want to honor God with our bodies at all times. And then number three, walk alongside others. Make that daily choice to live a holy life because it is much easier when you're walking alongside of other believers. If they need support and help, you're in a good condition to reach over and to support them. We want to surround ourselves with others who would also choose to live their lives for Christ. That would be an encouragement to us to continue in our struggle to live more like Christ every day. And by the way, your Bible study group is a great place to start to find those friends that can encourage you and that you can also encourage as they seek to follow Christ. Well, I like the way the author uh, ended our study, kind of much like we began it. He says here, we uh, were never destined to remain caterpillars. He says, God set us apart for something far greater. As Christ daily transforms us, we must let him continue the sanctification process. Well, I hope that this has been an encouragement to you, and I hope that God's word has spoken to you this morning. Thank you for being a part of this online Bible study experience. I know that it's different. I know that it's not what you would normally be experiencing if you were with a Bible study group at your church. But the Lord's word is still good, and I am thankful that we've heard it together today, and I do pray that the Lord encourages you through the study and the reading of his word today. May the Lord bless you and your families. We're praying for you at Lifeway. We are praying for our churches. We are praying for church members. We are praying for brothers and sisters in Christ and for all those folks in our country that are not yet connected to the Lord in a relationship and those that are not yet connected to a church family. Would you be alert for these folks that you come across in these days who need things like this? Pass this along. Encourage them to become part of online groups that you are uh, part of at your church. And when the pandemic passes and we're able to get together again, offer to bring them to your church. Offer to get them involved in a Bible study group. It makes all the difference. Well, again, my name is Ken Braddy, the director of Sunday School at Lifeway. And I pray that you have a safe week. And I will see you next time for the last study in this session, session number six. And I look forward to seeing you in about a week.